Hi, everybody. Uh, welcome to the uh, Experimenta series. My name is Alexi Gambis. I am uh, an ex-biologist, a filmmaker, and the artistic director of Imagine Science. Um, the Experimenta series has been around for maybe a month, and the idea is to get artists, get scientists, get science writers to talk a little bit about the intersect of, of science and the visual arts and how to communicate science um, to, um, to the public. And today we have the honor of having Carl Zimmer, who's a close friend and has been involved with the festival for, for quite some time. Carl is a science writer, popular science writer. He has um, a blog on National Geographic called The Loom. And he also has a column at the New York Times um, called Matter. And he is a big activist in terms of promoting science communication and writing about a variety of topics. And uh, thank you so much, Carl, for being here. Oh, good to be here, Alexis. Thanks a lot. So Carl, maybe we can begin, um, you know, and I'm sure a lot of the, the people that are listening uh, know a lot uh, about you, but maybe we could talk a little bit about, if you could just maybe introduce yourself and, and tell us a little bit, um, how would you, always a hard uh, question to have, but how would you define, you know, your, your daily kind of uh, work? Uh, sort of controlled chaos. Um, I've been writing about science for... Um, 20 odd years now, I guess. Wow. Um, I started at Discover Magazine and was there for about 10 years on staff and then started writing on my own books, magazine articles, blog posts you mentioned. Uh, and, you know, I, I like to, I try to um, explore a lot of different ways of writing about science and collaborating with artists and other people with other kinds of projects about science. Um, and so, you know, my main interest, I guess, is biology, uh, evolution, uh, but uh, I like to sort of see how that branches out into other areas like technology and medicine. Uh, and so, you know, it's it, I, one of the reasons I, I was, you know, got interested with the Imagine Film Festival is just because it's another one of these ways of, of using uh, a different medium to deal in one way or another with science, and um, you know, it's it's great. You know, there are many amazing things you can do just with words, but combining the words with with these other things um, is it's just fascinating to play around with. So, Carl, um, you know, I guess what we try to do at Imagine Science, and I guess what I I also uh, try to do, and is um, you know, I mean, the idea is to create stories about science, right? And um, whether you write about it, whether you have, you know, uh, kind of an artistic, you know, where you paint or draw about it or you make films, the goal really is to always have this, this element of narrative um, when, you're, when you're kind of communicating science because people, you know, at least what I get from it is that people respond to narrative, respond to stories. And I wanted to ask you a little bit, in, in your work, how have you encountered kind of the importance of visualizing science or even visualizing on the page through metaphors or through um, what's, what's been your experience and also with, you know, the project that you had with those tattoos. Um, what's, what's, um, what's your take about the importance of, of the visual aspect of, of science communication? Well, I think the, you hit on two of the most important things about, um, about science and communicating it. Um, one is that stories uh, have an incredible power and so do images. Um, so uh, you can can write about sort of the, the bare facts of, of science, you know, a fact here, a fact there, and so on, and it can feel kind of disconnected and maybe even a little pointless. But if you embed it in a story, you know, the story, say, of a scientist who is obsessed with trying to figure something out, or um, the story of, you know, a, you know, uh, how um, people tried to sol crack a code during World War II and, you know, the whole fate of the war turned on that, um, or, you know, the story of somebody with a disease who's trying to grapple with it and, and how, you know, medicine is just a, a part of their, of their real life. Um, people get carried along. People follow with you and people will be ready to pay attention along the way um, because, you know, one thing I always tell people who are starting out with science writing is that um, you know, no one's paying to read you um, and they can always go and do something else. So you have to, um, you know, you have to harness these tools, the tools that, you know, script writers in Hollywood know uh, much better than we do. 
And the other thing is images. Um, so, uh, you know, just kind of laying out the details on their own can kind of overwhelm somebody. But if you can create an image, either an image through a metaphor or, you know, collaborating with an illustrator or a, an animator or someone, you can create literal images, of, you know, something that people can see, and those can really kind of sum up um, a really complicated uh, concept a lot better than just, you know, adding on yet another written detail. Um, so, uh, so I really like um, being able to, to collaborate with people who, who make images um, because uh, I know that we're going to be able to complement each other. Um, and uh, so, and, and, you know, I, I also in recent years have worked on textbooks. I've written a couple textbooks. And one of the things I like most about that is that I'm working very closely with illustrators and we sort of say, like, okay, how can we take what, you know, some process of evolution that I've described in words, and how can we give you a picture so that you can just see it in your head and, and with that, really get it, you know. Thinking about the tree of life, for example, in evolution, um, you know, if, you, if I just tell it to you, it's just straight in words without any metaphorical language, it's, it doesn't really get in your bones. But if I show you some pictures and, you know, variations on, on the same idea in pictures, you might get the gist of it very well. And and Carl, have you? I, I'm curious. Have you ever been um, inspired to write a story or a book based on images that you saw? I mean, the, kind of the reversal of that, where you know, you, you talk a little bit about how in your writing, complementing that with 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 you know, illustrators and people that help you enhance maybe some of the writing. Have you? ever been in a position where an image or, you know, like for example, like a virus or like electron microscopy or something was really kind of the budding interest in that field or or maybe with the, the tattoos. I mean, how did that, how, I'm, I'm curious about like visuals being kind of the instigator for for some of your uh, your work. Oh, definitely. I mean, you know, if you, if you see, you know, well, the, the language of science, I mean, the technical language that scientists use among e each other, uh, among th that really can kind of uh, actually push you away if you're not already familiar with what it is. But so, you know, you can, um, you can read uh, an abstract for a paper about bacteriophages, you know, viruses that infect bacteria, and you feel like, you know, this is just a lot of minutia about something I just don't care about. Mm -hmm. uh, that would be the wrong thing conclusion to draw, but, you know, it's understandable if you're just reading the, the dry technical language um, in, in a scientific paper, whereas um, some scientists have collaborated with visualizers, um, you know, graphic artists, and have used what they know about phages to actually show you what it's like for a phage to infect a, a bacterium. And it just looks like insane science fiction. I mean, the virus itself, you know, it looks like a you know, like a lunar landing uh, module, uh, and, and you know, it looks like a machine, and it's landing and injecting, like kind of drilling into the bacteria and, and depositing these genes and other molecules, and you're like, what is going on? Uh, <laughs> and you want you want to find out more at that point. Um, so yeah, definitely, images can can lead me into wanting to find out more. And uh, I. Yeah, that's 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 it's it's true that this idea that like a picture has so much story kind of embedded into it, and that there's a bit of you know there's a bit of this um, yeah it seems like you know like the the whole idea that a picture is like a thousand words that really a picture can can just tell a whole story about the you know the drilling into a cell or things like that. I, I wanted to ask you. Um, you know, some people may say that you know there is this belief in, in especially in science videos. That you know that it's important to just tell the facts, you know, to uh, report the news, um, and that actually, you know, having kind of a human aspect to it kind of dilutes the science. Um, you know, there's so many sci science fiction films that are made that kind of stretch the facts. That there's yeah. some people that believe that the human drama of it is actually, you know, kind of you, you're veered away from the actual scientific content. So. You know, there's there is this belief that science news should just be the facts and and not about the science, but about the the breakthroughs. And and what's your take about that? Because a lot of the science, 
you know, when you tell people, when I tell people I make science films, they immediately think that I'm either making films for the Discovery Channel or that I'm making science fiction, but there isn't a lot to a gray zone in between that. But what, what's your take about kind of the science video aspect? Um, I, I think it's a really interesting kind of growth area, actually. Uh, and, you know, I mean, there have been, um, obviously, there's been science fiction for decades. There have been science documentaries, I'm sure, full-length things for a long time. But um, these shorter works are actually really interesting to me. Um, and, yeah, you know, and, you know, I, I, it is true that if you to get if you get that human element uh, and emotions into a into a science video, it can often really bring it alive. But you know you do want to be careful that you're not actually manipulating emotions um, to lead to the wrong uh, kind of conclusion. You know, uh, mm. I mean it's it's very I mean, you know, there's a lot that's wrong about how emotions are manipulated to communicate about. Science. I mean, if you look at how um, people who want to sort of raise doubts about vaccines, they will use a human element. They will use emotions. They will cast uh, anybody who who does research on vaccines or uh, who you know pr creates creates something to provide the evidence about that there is about vaccines. They'll just say, oh, you know, they're like the evil ones. They are, you know, all about just making money or something like that. So they're, they're you know, that's a human element you don't want in it. Um, mm -hmm. But, you know, if you find the right story and you can really stick to it and really, you know, delve into the real human uh, side of, of science, then, then it works best. And that's true and science videos and it's true in stories I think um, and it can either be you know people for example who are you know dealing with a, a, something of a scientific nature just say for example a, a person who's got a very rare genetic disorder I mean I wrote about someone like that recently and you know um, you know, I would get emails from, you know, neuroscientists saying, you know, oh, that made me cry several times, and I just think, good. Um, mm -hmm. And, but, you know, at the same time, that story, uh, it was in the Atlantic, I mean, there was a lot of emotion on, in the scientists themselves, you know. These scientists, these doctors have been trying to cure this disease for 20 years, and they've learned a lot, but, you know, they still can't say, like, here, take this, and you'll be okay, and they've had to watch some of their patients die, and it's, you know, it's hard, um, and there's nothing wrong with bringing that into the story. I mean, that's just reality. Yeah, no, it's, it seems, I mean, that the scientific process is, is very much linked to kind of emotions and passions, and there's all this backstory that's happening behind you know, we're always focusing on the scientific, like the end results, but the the machinery behind it is like filled with emotional charge, and and I think that there there isn't enough emphasis on that. But, um, but how how has video in in your in your work? I mean, um, especially like things like this, like the Google Hangout, for example. How has video mm -hmm. um helped you in terms of communicating your ideas? And I've I'm I'm also curious. Have you ever been approached by any filmmakers or anybody making films about taking some of your work and maybe adapting it uh, into into a film or into a documentary. Um, um, maybe talk, tell me a little bit about about that about video and in, in your kind of and how that's grown in your in your realm. Um, it's you know in, in directly in my own work, it's it's something that's been bubbling and the sort of coming more to a boil recently. Um, I, I got really interested, for example, in a, in a video uh, project called Blogging Heads where two people would have a conversation like we are, but they didn't have Google writing the software for them, so we would just put cameras on our computers and just record that way. And that was fun. I mean, I did that for a couple years, I guess. And um, also podcasting is kind of similar, like where I'd have interviews with scientists. And, um, you know, I... I it's 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 still you know the, the words, but it's it's a different kind of way of doing it, where you're having a conversation and you're trying to coax 
something at you know a, a stories out of people and kind of push a little more to figure out what's going on and um, I, I think that's really interesting and and I you know I, I think there's room for more of that uh, in in science um, you know I there's a very popular I mean, and you're starting to see, like, you know, uh, uh, a lot of stuff with radio, like with Radio Lab, which is about science. This American Life is sometimes about science, and they're doing all this stuff with sound, and I, I would hope that there'd be more stuff like that on video um, mm -hmm. in the near future. I mean, right now, you know, it's, it's really cool to see the experiments that are going on with video, so... Um, the people who do TED, those those uh, talks, they have an education side, and they're just churning out animations like a couple every week, having to do with um, stuff for for science education. So I had a really good experience with that. I, I wrote, I, I just wrote a little script about um, birds and how they evolve feathers, uh, and you know, just read that, and then it was recorded, and then an, an animator, like, took that, and then a lot of material I supplied her with, and just created a gorgeous, um, you know, set of images for about three minutes that went along with that, and it was sort of like a, a moving illustration of what I was talking about. So, um... And how, how did that feel, to, to have kind of your, your, your work visualized, and, and, and was it, how, what was that kind of reaction that you had to that? Were you, were you, did you feel that it represented well the, the story, or did it yeah. add something to it? Or? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it, 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 was, it was creating those, those visual metaphors that I was talking about before, so that someone could hear me talking, and they would see something that just sort of crystallized what I was trying to get at. Um, and, I, you know, that's one of those cases where it actually works. You know, the things work together. I mean, sometimes, you know, the, the visuals and the story or the text just, they they are in, on different planets, and that's that's unfortunate when you see that happening. You know, where someone's like reading kind of a dry script, and there's like all these like fireworks going on on the screen that really have nothing to do with yeah. the the science. So I lucked out, and um, you know, it, the great thing about this kind of video is that they put it on YouTube, and it's just there, uh, and it just you know people just keep discovering it and um, and watching it and and learning from it. So, um, we'll, yeah, put it, so we'll, we'll also link it to the website so that people mm -hmm. can see it. So, uh, yeah. Yeah. No. Um, yeah. Sorry. I didn't no, go, go ahead. Go ahead. No, so I, I was, uh, so right. So you were mentioning Radiolab and, and This American Life and, and it's true that, that they really, they really do a very good job at kind of using sound as a way of illustrating stories. And to some extent, like, I, I mean, my impression is that that the that video, science video, is a little behind, um, and as you know, this idea of, because there's such a strong sense of storytelling and narrative and a beginning to the story and an end. You know, there's like a a journey that you go through with Radio Lab where they where you talk about something and you you navigate through different worlds. And um, mm -hmm. I feel like the 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 video part of that is is still kind of you know I think people are experimenting with that but I, I think there's still a lot of, a lot of work to be done uh, with that um, I was gonna so let's talk a little bit about you you mentioned something about short like short films you know and mm -hmm. maybe you could talk a little bit about um, well first of all let's talk just for the people out there about maybe the history of of your involvement with Imagine Science and um, mm -hmm. And how that came about, and maybe I can add to that. Um, but maybe your your point of view on, on that. Well, I remember we met a few years ago when you were um, at Rockefeller, and I'd given a Rockefeller University in New York, and I'd given a talk there, and we met, and you were telling me about this film festival you wanted to do about science films, and I don't remember my exact words that I said, but I was I just sort of I don't know why I just felt like giving you a hard time because <laughs> I. I I sort of felt that, um, you know, there's a lot of science-related stuff out there, you know, in movies and TV that I just didn't like, and that uh, I felt was sort of preachy or sort of just was supposed to be propaganda, and that the stuff that was the movie movies that I, that related to science that I enjoyed most were the ones that played fastest and loosest with. Yeah. Science kind of used it as just raw material to really just have fun with, and yeah. 
so you know I think I, I in a sense it was a, it was a way to sort of challenge you um, and you responded by you know talking me into being a judge at the festival so well I remember uh, I remember when that happened when I when I told you about the science film festival um, I didn't have any films in mind <laughs> <laughs> I just had this idea of organizing a film festival and I remember because I approached many you know I approached you and I also approached venues and they would be like okay great this sounds like a great idea uh, so what are the films? And uh, I said, oh, I don't, I don't have films yet, but uh, that's the, that's the next step. But um, but yeah. So then, so then you were on the on the on the jury, and you, I think you've been on the jury maybe like three or this will be the because you're on the jury this year as well. Mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. This will be the, what the fourth time, the third something time. Something like that. Yeah, something like that. So let let let's give like just a little bit of an overview. So these are films that are submitted by anybody. You know, so these are not necessarily films that are big productions. They're short films. Some of them are made by scientists. Some of them are made by people that have no, you know, no science background. But everybody gets a go at like tackling different subjects using mm -hmm. animation, documentaries. What has, you know, it's obviously a whole discussion to have about that. But how's your experience being, you know, watching these films and the quality of these films and uh, people experimenting on different subjects? How how has that been for you? Uh, one of the things I like about it is that it, it reminds me of how um, blogging changed journalism and traditional publishing, um, and maybe I should say blogging and ebook publishing now, uh, where you know it used to be with writing like if you if you wanted to um, write something, uh, you had to go through a particular kind of narrow channel. You had to to you know, uh, get the thumbs up from editors or publishers, people who like basically had the, had those channels th through which you could reach your, your audience. And what blogging did was said, well, okay, here you go. Um, you can publish something on the internet, and theoretically, anybody can read it. Um, and so people, you know, there was. It's I, I'm a, I'm. It's been about ten years now that I've been blogging, and and I just remember like about 10 years ago, like, I and a bunch of other people just, like, discovering, like, wow, you know, you can do anything. And so what's come of that has been a lot of stuff. <laughs> mm -hmm. a, a lot of it is, you know, um, maybe not, you know, maybe need some, maybe could use some good editing, um, but a lot of it is stuff that really wouldn't have come about. It's really good if you had had a kind of traditional model. Um, and so I just I, I just think it's just so great that that people can make these movies just I don't know with their phone or something like that and and edit it online and so uh, so it so it's a much bigger group of people are doing it and um, and so you know like uh, you know it's, what we were talking about it you they're gonna be like sixty this year or something that. 60, I think 65 films, and I think uh, something like uh, 17 different countries or something like that, yeah. Right, and that's just that's what you've picked out for right. us judges to, to take a look at. And, you know, in previous years it's been around that number, and, and you know, there's some where, like, after five seconds I'm just like, I, I don't like this. Um, and then there are others that, um, you know, I, I, I think, ah, I watch them all the way through, I'm like, that's okay, it's not great. Um, and there's some that are just incredibly captivating, and you know, often it's just because they. I, I find that it's because though I mean we're talking, these are short films, and so yeah. it's not like a full length movie. So I, what I find is that like, you know, somebody's able in like eight minutes or ten minutes to kind of set you up in a story with certain expectations. Maybe it's based on the way you tend to think about science. And then they they get a they get a twist in there that you did not see coming, and it can just be um, you know a, a plot twist, or it can just be like a strange image that just you didn't see coming. Um, and uh, and sometimes it it can be kind of upsetting, and sometimes it can be incredibly funny. Um, uh, there was one I think it was last year. Um, where uh, the, there it was a uh, you remind me of the name you'll know what the, the one I'm talking about where it's it's an interview with a engineer who builds amusement park rides 
Oh, it was a centrifuge brain project, yeah. The centrifuge brain project. Yeah. And I find it so funny because it starts total deadpan, just this guy, you know, talking about, you know, what, a, what he does as an engineer, you know, and doing these experiments to, to you know, affect people's brains by, you know, putting them in amusement park rides. And very gently, the rides he's talking about, the footage you see just gets crazier and crazier and crazier until you're like, there are these beautiful, insane, impossible amusement park rides. They're like uh, octopus tentacles writhing around up into the stratosphere or something, and and he's still <laughs> totally straight. Um, I love that one. I just, you know, I still think and about what, it. What was the what was the hypothesis of that? Was that the the centrifuge on the on the on these rides? What, what would they do to the brain? It was something like they would uh they would enhance brain activity or something. Yeah, I forget what it yeah. Is. Yeah, and so he's just he's just sort of talking about about it, uh, you know, in a very straight sort of sedate way about you know why 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 he wants to do this and you know how how different experiments worked out or didn't work out. Um, and again, you know, with um, computer editing now, I mean, the the people who made that movie were able to just integrate these crazy kind of effects into these yeah. straight amusement park foregrounds. Um, I think it's on Vimeo, if you, if you can link to that. I, I just, I, I put it on my blog uh, after after we saw that one because it just... That, that actually won the, one of the, you know, Nature Publishing Group gives a, yeah. gives us awards, and that won the audience, that actually won the audience award, so that was... That yeah, was, yeah we'll, we'll also link that as well. Um, I, just, just jumping off a little bit what you said, What's great about these short films is that there's no, you know, as you were saying, people can now make films with their iPhones. They can, you know, they can go out, they can do stuff online and do crazy animations. Um, and there's no agenda. There's no real agenda. You know what I mean? Like we always think of science films that we see on TV or uh, all the news to have like always like a strong message or or. But this is just like you know, people are just having fun um, uh, tackling. Well, yeah. yeah, they should. They should. They should be. And I mean, you know, it, 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 the only advice I would give to people who are trying their hand at this sort of stuff is yeah. to just make sure they don't fall into cliches. Um, yeah. And you know, the tricky thing about cliches is that you often don't realize you're using them. And so you have to be really mindful. I mean, when I teach science writing, that's something that I'm always trying to push students on is just to sort of say like are you like are you just are you just grabbing a cardboard cutout uh, of story elements or of personality and uh, instead of really doing some observation doing some real reporting and seeing what people are really like or, or what really happened I mean you should be looking for the surprise and at, that you can use to tell your story in a, in a deeper way and um, and I think that's the same with making making these sorts of movies, you know. Um, I mean, and, and you know, I mean, what I what I've noticed in terms of cliches, like w looking at some of these movies, is uh, and it's not just movies in the festival; it's just like on TV or in movie theaters, you know, like the character of a scientist. Yeah. So a a scientist is either. Um, you know, this, like, just incredibly um, heroic person who is just all about saving the world um, or, you know, is some evil, uh, you know, person who wants to take over the planet or works for a big faceless corporation or whatever. Um, and, you know, you and I, we know lots of scientists. We know they're not, none of them are like that, and, and some of them are just ordinary folks and some of them are very strange but they're all human beings and so you know I, I it's uh, I would just I like it when you know if if there is a scientist in a movie or even in a story that it's somebody new um, and and that that's just better storytelling do you think it's important Carl to when you're talking about the science in a film to really you know, kind of describe the scientists behind the science? I mean, do you do that in your writing where if you're talking about a specific, you know, I, I saw the article on MERS, or do, do you talk about the scientists as much as the science when you're covering a story, or what's, what's the balance really between that? 
It it really depends on on the story, um, on the length of the story, on yeah. the place where I'm publishing it. Um, so you know, if you've got a short piece on a new paper, you know, you don't have a lot of uh, wiggle room to kind of get into you know where someone grew up and right, you know, right, right. how they became a scientist and all that. Yeah. Um, um, you know, whenever I can, I, I do try to do that. I mean, I just I, I try to make things into into just stories whenever I possibly can, and, and even relatively short stories. You know, you can just start by saying, okay, where where did the scientist get this idea to do this crazy experiment? I mean, wh or why did they go hunting for that fossil? Or you know, what 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 prompted this? And um, you know, and that, and and so I do think that that's really helpful. Um, in, in just kind of, it, it humanizes the story, and by humanizing it, you know, the reader just is carried along and, and wants to find out about what's going on, too. Um, and, you know, even like a, you mentioned MERS, so there's this virus in the Middle East, uh, which is, you know, slowly spreading and is quite mysterious. We've known about it for a year, but we still don't know much about it. Um, you know, they're, they're at least... Um, you know, I wanted to get in touch with one of the scientists who's been studying it to try to get a feel from them about what just what it's like to be at this point where they know not they know a lot not a lot less than they would like. Um, yeah. Now, to really tell that story, you know, you actually want to go to Saudi Arabia and you just get into all the real human side of this. Yeah. Um, but you know, that <laughs> that's a bit of that's an undertaking. Of course, like it depends on the format, and that that brings me to a point, which is that um, that you know at least with with the festival and what I've seen um, is that there are a lot more scientists now that are actually the ones documenting their own work. Mm -hmm. um, I you know we get a lot of home videos, you know not not all of them are great, you know because you know I mean you know we had like a film about a PCR rap, somebody rapping about PCR. <laughs> we have all uh -huh. these. But you know, but they're interesting because they provide like uh, they definitely are not cliche in the sense that they're from the interior of the lab. You know, somebody taking out a camera between like a centrifuge and a vortex and filming himself. And so we get a lot of those uh, that are also pretty. Inf you know, it's almost like a little bit of a like a webcam into a into a laboratory and into what happens. And uh, I think those are important. But Carl, do you have any? Um, any favorite types of films? I mean, or do you like all kinds? I mean, do you, do you prefer do in, in terms of like the speaking of like science films and the mm -hmm. ones that are not too cliche out there? Do you have an inclination to prefer you know documentaries or fiction or or animation or do you like a bit of all of it? What's your kind of palette of of in filmmaking and science filmmaking? Um, you know, I I I I, I guess uh, I like. I mean, when I'm just, you know, looking on Netflix or go, thinking about going out to the movies, you know, I'll definitely be interested if there's a movie with science in it, but I want it to be, you know, I, I prefer actually to have it where the science is, like, very sort of deeply yeah. submerged. Um, or not maybe submerged, but sort of integrated. I mean, it is, you know, it's, it. there's, um, and when you think about it, I mean, this is, See, this I think is true in terms of movies and also in terms of journalism. Um, you know, uh, there are, you know, I call myself a science writer, and I guess there's this sort of particular little, you know, chunk of journalism that you could call science writing. But um, you know, the fact is that writing about science can and should appear in the sports section. You know, when you're talking about, you know, designing better swimsuits for swimmers or talking about brain injuries in football or, you know, science should be in the business section of the newspaper. It is in the business section, you know, when there's a, you know, what Google does or what, you know, biotech companies do or, you know, what most companies do is based in science in one way or the other. Um, and, you know, being able to explain that science will make that business reporting better. Yeah. Um, and so with movies, you know, I kind of feel the same way that, you know, I don't, I, mean, I, I think it's great that there are initiatives like the film festival, like, you know, uh, the Sloan Foundation and other places that are promoting science in the movies. But, um, but you know, I think, I think there has to be, I, I think it's better, 
I think it would be good to, to make sure that didn't create a little box. Yeah. Um, and, um, you know, and if you just think about movies, you know, like there's there are these science elements in all sorts of movies um, that you might not think about. I mean, think about, like, the movie Moneyball. It's a mm -hmm. baseball movie. But, you know, what it is is Brad Pitt realizing that um, he has to, uh, you know, think statistically. You know, he has yeah. to stop thinking by anecdote. You know, he kind of has to be a bit of a scientist. So I would consider that a science movie. Yeah. Um, no, you, and you, you touch on a really important point, which is, because um, I, I couldn't agree more with this um, idea that in order for the science to be, you know, because I get the same thing. People say, oh, so you're only interested in making science films, Alexi? And I say, well, no, I mean, I, I make, you know, I, I create stories and I just so happen to be interested in these topics, but it's, it's not about that. But we have this, always this debate every year about, you know, scientists are never, they say, oh, there's not enough science in this film. Or, you know, mm -hmm. everybody doesn't agree about, like, the right amount of science or, you know, I, I, I tend to be, to agree with you in the sense that it's the back, it's like the, it's the backdrop, right? It's part of the the, the world around it, or mm -hmm. or it may it may come up in a discussion between two characters and, and science, but but that it's important that the science not be like you know up there in the forefront and lecturing somebody about something, but it's like really embedded. So well, yeah, I mean, and and it can be. I mean, I'm not saying that it has to be like really subtle, and you have to kind of think think afterwards, like oh, that's about science. I mean, so you know, take a movie like Contagion. I mean, obviously, that's a movie about science. I mean, it's a movie about emerging diseases, like like MERS, what we were just talking about. It's like what would happen, you know, what would happen if MERS turned out to be really bad, and you know, spread around the world. And um, uh, it's there. There's a ton of science in there, and and um, and you know, and they had good medical and scientific advisors. You know, when and if there's a global pandemic, that's what it'll look like, and. Um, but, uh, you know, they really, um, but that alone didn't sort of drive the story, the, the drive the movie. You yeah. know, they didn't say, like, okay, how can we get as much science as possible in here? Yeah. You know, what they said was, let's make this story about, about these group of people who endure an outbreak. Yeah. And let's just make it as realistic as possible, you know, which means let's, like, get into the science. And um, so, you know, so people are not, like, saying, you know, don't they don't, you know, watch it and then with Kate Winslet talking about, you know, R, the, the, the value for how easily a virus can spread. They don't say, oh, great, here, you know, here comes an epidemiology. You know, they're not happy that we're in the epidemiology part of the movie. It's like, they're thinking like, oh my God, like, you know, people are dying and how, how are they going to stop this? Yeah. You know, and this is how they do it. I mean, by deploying this sort of science. Um, and uh, so I think that's, you know, one example of, of how you can do it pretty effectively, I think. Yeah, no, and, and, and just to kind of like wrap it up here, but I, I, I um, it almost seems that people have to go, I mean, just depict scientists as ordinary people or, 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 you know, that there's always, maybe because of a bit of ignorance or, or, or what, whatever it is, there's always this tendency of, you know, putting science on this other level, as you were saying, kind of the mad scientist or, or, or you know, the recluse scientist, but just like depict them a little bit like Centrifuge Brain Project where it's obviously like, you know, kind of a bit of a science fiction plot, mm -hmm. but they're depicting these people as being kind of these ordinary Every day, you know, like scientists are not different than anybody else, and that that I think that's important in terms of people identifying also with scientists and realizing, oh, maybe I will become a scientist, or maybe I will do this because, you know, uh, there's always this, you know, this kind of myth that scientists are like on an, on another wavelength or something. So, yeah, that's true, and and I think, but I think, um, uh, well. I think that you know one way to to deal with that is to um, to kind of like look at you know what it, the the practice of science and kind of kind of show how that is just part of what human beings do to try to figure out their place in the world and what they should do. Um, so you know one of my favorite documentaries uh, is Fast, Cheap, and Out of Control by uh, Errol Morris. Mm 
Love that film, yeah. Yeah, great movie. And there you've got, you know, a robotics engineer, uh, and you've got a guy who makes topiaries, and you have someone who raises naked mole rats. Um, I love mole rats. <laughs> yeah. So those were three. Was there a fourth? I can't remember. Um, um, I forget. I forget, yeah. Yeah, well, anyway, I gotta, I gotta see it again. Um, I mean, what was just so great about it was that he took these different people and kind of wove them together into this just totally fascinating meditation about, um, you know, how how we try to understand the natural world and to some extent try to control it. And um, you know, it's it's kind of a it's. You know, it's doomed to failure to a certain extent, and um, and it sort of makes you ask, like, well, why do we want to do this? Um, and science, and, and the scientist is there along with the other people, and they're all, you know, on that same quest. They're just going about it in different ways, and you see those parallels. So, you know, I just sort of, I I I like that, you know. I like bringing, I like it when people can bring science in artfully like that, um, so that it's just part of life. Well, thank you, Carl. I, I want to end by asking you, so have you ever been, so what the question I had before was, have you ever been approached about um, one of your stories or one of your, you know, one of your write-ups to, to be translated into film? You talked a little bit about the, about the bird um, metaphor, but that, that's another question. I, I want to probe into that a little more. And then the other one is, have you ever been interested in writing scripts? Um... Yeah, no, I, I'm, I've definitely, um, well, the, the things I've written about, I mean, people have um, uh, contacted me because they realize it's something that's interesting f for them to do in terms of a documentary. Um, uh, there, you know, one thing I really like is that there have been people who have read some of my creepier pieces, like on parasites, and like wrote a whole book on parasites, and they would take that and kind of, turn, let that switch on their science fiction novel writing brains and write a science fiction novel kind of based on, you know, the idea of parasites manipulating hosts. Um, and what I love about that is that, you know, they get, they pull people in and then they'll say like, well, you know, they'll say at the end of the book, like, you would not believe it, but, you know, this is all based on this real stuff that's really crazy. And, you know, they point mm -hmm. people to the science and I'm like, that's great. Um, you know, I, uh, I, I, I uh, believe it or not, I got called up by the people who were doing the movie World War Z because they were trying to like think about zombie biology. They were ta calling in some scientists <laughs> and they called me, uh, and I was like, uh, it's like "Okay, Paul, can you help us here? We're, we're we're trying to figure out the zombie biology here." <laughs> yeah, my ideas didn't really fly. Uh, you know, <laughs> you don't what you see on the screen is not you know thanks to Carl Zimmer, but it was fun. You know, uh, like I was trying to think about like. You know how how our bodies stay warm in the cold, the brown fat, and you know maybe you could maybe zombies don't have brown fat. I don't know, but in, in any case, <laughs> like, like apop apoptosis and cell death. Yeah, yeah. You see now now you're thinking about it. Now you're thinking about yeah. it. So so yeah. So that that stuff is fun. Um, and and yeah. I mean maybe yeah maybe maybe as I sort of explore this more, maybe that's will be a direction I, I go in. But still, it's it's very fun to be. On the um, you know, on the DVD extras for World War Z, you know, talking about insect swarming. It's a oh weird moment. I have to check that out. Oh my god! Yeah, get your copy. Um, and are you? Are, and the last question is: Would you ever consider like writing scripts, or 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 would that and be something that Carl Zimmer would do in in the future, or? Um, it, yeah, yeah, it, it possibly. I mean, you know, I would definitely approach it with caution. Um, you know, like I think when I was in my twenties, I tried doing scripts a couple times, and I just sort of sit there after a while and say, "Oh, this is hard, right? Okay." <laughs> so, but but no, it, it there there is a there are there's definitely an, an allure to it, no question. Well, Carl, I can't I can't thank you enough for doing this. Uh, I think this has been this has been really great, and um, you know, in a few days you'll be receiving the films, the 65 films for the festival that's going to start on October 11th, and it's opening at Google uh, New York. And you know, this year the theme is data and how how to take all kinds of data, genome data, you know, uh, computer data, and create stories out of that. So mm -hmm. um, there will be a mix. It'll definitely be a mix. You know, I think we received about like a thousand films. We bring it down wow. to like 65, so it's a pretty big. 
but still, you know, there will be some favorites and, and, and all that. So, but uh, but anyway, we'll be in touch. You're also going to be moderating a panel right at the New York Academy of yeah. Sciences on how to visualize data, um, and we'll post some information on that. Uh, I think tickets are already up for that. Uh, that's on October 17th at the New York Academy. But thank you, Carl, so much, and uh, have a have a great day. You're in Connecticut, and I'm in Abu Dhabi, so this is like <laughs> technology right here, and it yeah. seems to be working fine. So. That seems to be. Good, yeah. Uh, looking forward to seeing the movies. Okay, Carl. Thank you so much. All right. And bye we'll bye. be posting all that online, the, the videos and uh, Centrifuge Brain Project and the bird video. We'll, we'll post that. Great. Thanks, Carl. Bye-bye.